But when I got that day, one of the most important lessons I got from that day, well, really two of them was atonement. Atonement was important. The atonement was stress. The importance of atoning and purging ourselves from imperfections that we might have dealt with throughout our lives and making ourselves better people. And I decided that's what I needed right now because I became conflicted working on Rikers Island because sometimes you get placed in a situation that you're not comfortable with. You know what I mean? There's so many lives I couldn't save, and I felt bad about that. Because you meet so many brothers who are locked up saying they're innocent, and you're trying to save, but it's just too many. And I felt bad because I couldn't save a lot of brothers. And then there's violence that you witness sometimes. So I had to atone. So I, I came back a better man. But another thing that, 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 that was mentioned that day, too, was to come back to our community and make a difference. Yes. And understand the power of art and culture. And to go back and try to establish institutions to, up, up, to, to elevate artwork. So I came back with that determination to do what I could to elevate art in the sense that it could bring us together as a people. So just seeing you all here today, it, it lets me know that we met on this path for a reason. Art has brought us together. And um, I just feel good that I, I could just continue to uphold the principles of not only the Million Man March, but my ancestors that came before. So that's what Jamel has been able to capture the history. And when I see that piece behind, it reminds me of the jazz piece, The Great Day in Harlem. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, that Great Day in Harlem piece, I see that, and that, it's almost like you were in front of the same brownstone mm -hmm. that those brothers, the, the jazz musicians, that was in 58 that did that Great Day in Harlem. Mm -hmm. So he's captured, he's captured us, and he's captured our people. He has captured the goodness about us, and I think that's important. He's, he's captured the specialness about us. And I'm just glad and, 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 and very honored to be a part of his gathering, part of his life. But well, most important, brothers like Jamal, Mr. Green, uh, Brother Green, Sharif, align yourself with the older brothers who are doing progressive positive things and get that information so that you can relate to folks in your, your category and, and, and up. But always stay in line with these brothers. Very important. The, the youth don't really connect to the elders. You're saying, and, and as much as say, you, you're like the, how you say, the, um, the mediator between that bridge. So stand in the middle and say, go from here, go from here, and teach. This was before the gentrification. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in this community in Bed Stuy, mm -hmm. there was the white flight. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, when, when we came, when we came in and we started, you know, all the other folks, they moved out to East Cupcake Long Island somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they left us here, you see. But now, it's profitable. Mm -hmm. Brownstones went up, say, I used to say, don't, don't sell that brownstone. You know, now the brownstones are coming, they, they work almost a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And they're coming back in, and they say, like, almost, you get out of our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This is what's happening right now. And so, you know, I, I'm digressing, you know, a little bit, but, you know, you know the thing about it is, is that, that uh, corrections and everything made many of us see the total spectrum of what was happening in the department mm -hmm. and in our community. You know, I mean, I, I was about to transfer to PD, but family members said, stay where you are, <laughs> you know. And I saw a lot and saw many things that we needed to change. And recognizing the math, whatever you think was a coincidence, don't think it's a coincidence, because it ain't a coincidence. It's like, pay close attention. Because then, it inevitably, you start to get ahead of reality, of time. There's a way to do it. I've had moments in my life where I felt it happen. You know, I think what they call um, um, serendipity. Mm -hmm. Those type of things. I mean, I've had instances where certain people I'm vibing with, and we might clap at the same time, or somehow cough, you know, little subtleties. Somehow, that's, that's real math, and it's all around you. And one other last note, whatever you really need, it ain't, it ain't really necessary to chase the dream. Because what you really need is right in front of you. It's in your path. But you have to be able to discern what's real and identify it and don't be spooked. You know, we, we, can't, we can't dwell in superstition. You know, we are, it's, it's, it's innate in, our, in us. But certain things, it ain't about superstition. It's recognizing what's real and what you need. I mean, literally any given day of the week, I can have something on my mind or something I'm pursuing and walk right into it. Well, I'd like to add one. You know, good evening, Mr. Pam, I 
too worked in the Department of Corrections for 20 years, and you saw a lot of devastation. But what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of folks suffered from mental illnesses. With the mental illness week that just passed by, I realized that that may be for some, but our mental illness started the moment we hit these shores. And so I just wanted to say that be kind to people when you can because you don't know what the person across from you, in front of you, behind you, beside you is going through. So just have patience and be kind. I mean, we're not, I'm not talking about being passive and just accepting any type of behavior, but try to be kind to the next person because you just have no idea what they're going through. I mean, in regards to our community, there's a lot of healing that needs to take place. Um, in regards to just what has been normalized and what's accepted behavior. Um, there's many dysfunctions that we celebrate, you know what I mean, and that we also defend, and we don't need to defend them anymore. You know, it's kind of like, it's a time for me at least that we need to really put the microscope on ourselves. I just to share with you my little 35 millimeter camera. I'm trying to get it today. He would take it. I got my job, I was the photographer. Uh, all the parties, I took pictures. I have boxes of pictures. I wish I had it today to show you that little 35 that he carried. <laughs> when I think about going back into the Bible, it says, teach a child the way he is to go, and he will not fall far from it. <laughs> I think I did a damn yes. good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but to hear all the comments today, all the beautiful things that you know about him, been with him, it is such a joy to look around the room at all the beautiful photography. When I go to his house, you can't get in there because there's books, photography, all over the place. I could sit there for days and hours and just open books and read about him. Jamel, I am so proud of you. I love you with all my heart. say I am, you were saying that you were God. And that's what the 5% has talked about. That's what the Rock has talked about. That's what Jesus talked about. Um, as far as us uh, learning and making uh, or getting rid of the baggage, we come to this earth with baggage and our goal is to empty it. When we don't, we come back again. Mm -hmm. My grandson just came to this planet I don't know who he was in his last life, but I know he knew who I was, um, and he chose to come so that I could learn something from him. And that's what happens. Sometimes it takes us, it took, they say it took Jesus 33 years. Um, sometimes it takes us many lifetimes, but we do learn, so our goal should be to come here and and empty our bags so that we don't have to come back to learn the same lesson, mm -hmm. a lesson again, because that I have from um, the problem that I have, first of all, this is, this is the way I'm going to do this. If you look at every single photograph on this wall and hanging in the seat, from the seal, every single one, there are no niggers mm -hmm. in these photographs. That's right. There are no niggers, no niggas, no niggas. That's right. Nothing like that. I grew up in Selma, Alabama mm -hmm. in the 60s, and early 50s and 60s. And I know what discrimination is. Okay? And I know that we, as black people, are helping other people discriminate against us. Mm -hmm. Because we go around and we talk to each other. Yo, my nigga, what's up? Yes. Yo, dog, we didn't do it. I heard my father say it once. But my father said it in the company of men who were like him. And they were in a field. And when they spoke loudly to each other about their crop, and one of them said, well, Brian, I don't think that you should have done that that way with those watermelons. 
And he said to his friend, this man I don't know you. But he said it no. But he never said it in public. Mm -hmm. So my life has been deputized since the age of nine. I marched. I did all of those things in the South. I fought for you, some of you, to come here. And then I turn around, and a police officer on Church Avenue says to a female police officer from the Dominican Republic, you see that nigga right there? Now I bet you he has a gun. I'm coming past McDonald's, and I hear this, and she said, mm -hmm. women, we can't do that. We have no fight against anyone. We are mothers, whether we have children or not. And our job is to save our children. We don't side with anyone, no matter what the job is. So then I walked over to them and I said, look, I just heard what you said. He said, you don't need to talk to me. I said, yes, I do, because I pay your check. Mm. <laughs> I pay your check. And you just called me a nigga. He said, I didn't say you were a nigga. I said, that's right. You said he was, whoever he is that is gone now. And she said, move along. I said, come with me. <laughs> because you are upholding him. And if that young man from the Caribbean over there is a nigga, so are you, young lady. Mm -hmm. you. The Me Too movement struck a lot of us. But you can't wait until the movement starts. Mm -hmm. Because the movement with hands start right away. They don't say, oh, well, I'm going to just touch you right now. And then you can run and tell somebody later on. You speak up right away. I didn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. If the white man had nine guns, my father had 15. Mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. And if my father didn't have them, my brothers had things that would take care of them. So I ran and told Dad. No, I did not ran and told my brother because I couldn't tell Dad everything. He was the target. So I ran and told my brothers. And that took care of the Me Too movement in my time. Mm -hmm. So now I can take care of myself, so I don't worry about that. And I don't know if I three friends. I called them the dream girls back then. <laughs> but this beautiful sister, I haven't seen since I took that picture wow. all them years ago. Wow. Wow. And <laughs> She, she, she's the one, one of my Instagram feed, the four sisters, the fly girls, I call them fly girls. She still fly. <laughs> so Father was saying that, and he always just took to me and was like, you know, y'all sisters are going to be great. And, and told us, you know, just give, gave us enlightening words and things like that. But um, I don't have much to say, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative that I'm able to be a part of, of your journey. I'm able to be, see myself in these magazines and books every so often. I see myself and I'm like, what do you mean? With the energy that's here and gravitating to everyone and listening, I have learned so much. I really thought I knew it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but just being here has been amazing. Uh, I met Brother Jamel and I have become fascinated with photography. You know, when I met him in the beginning, I said, wow, I just picked up a camera and I'm trying to do what you do. I'm like, and I said, well, Johnny, how am I going to try to do what he <laughs> But he was so encouraging. He said, take it one day at a time. Because, you know what he said to me? And I take this because I told myself, I've shot over, since I got the camera, I, I did over, whew, probably about 4,000 pictures in a couple of months. Just shoot. He said, just shoot. He just said, just go, just go. He actually encouraged me to, um, to go out and shoot pictures. I work with the housing authority, so I've been shooting pictures of the elders that are inside the authority who are working in certain programs that I think. And what I did, after listening to him, I actually, I'm actually doing like a photo book out of them and, how they've been in the authority, how they're living, how they look, how they feel, you know, and what they looking to do in the future and doing an intergenerational thing. So I am I humbly thank you for hearing your stories. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, when I look at all of the photos that you put together, you know, few words really resonated, came to mind really, and that was pride. Mm -hmm.
strength, resilience. And that in of for family, for community, for culture, for blackness, you know? And it brings me a lot of joy, internal joy, um, but a lot of hope too. I have my, my six-year-old son, he's here. And um, just that hope that, you know, that he can be free to be. Talk to this man. At the end of the day, he's a young man, but don't take away the fact that we do have mental disabilities in our community that are so strong that people are afraid to even start the conversation. It's real. Mm -hmm. Our black men have so much pride, they don't want to say, I'm hurting. You know what I mean? They have so much pride, they don't want to take a moment, and this man said in the jails in the middle of the night, these men are crying. It's okay if you cry with me. I'm not going to speak to you like you're less than a man. You're a human first. We have these little babies coming up from six years old, 10 years old, treating them like men. It's okay to feel. It's all right. But at the end of the day, we need people around us, like you said, we need more people that need to take more responsibility. Stop babying people. Stop making excuses for people. When you see that they're getting out of line, treat them like they used to. Each one, teach one. People in your neighborhood used to be able to pull you like, look, I know your mother's not here, but I'm wrangling you for now. Because at the end of the day, you know that's going to affect you later on in life. That same young man is going to come back and say, Miss so-and-so, Mr. so-and-so, thank you for always taking the time for me. It was good to know that aside from my mother who's working all those hours, someone else cared for me. Someone cares out there. And I just think that if our people understood the power that we have, if we understood the strength and the power that we have, we would be so dangerous. I think we should be very careful about looking at the things that are eye candy. Um, young men in this country who are black, or black of African descent, have always been the enemy. Um, so when we, we criticize the obvious things, we have to understand what our introduction to this society was. Our introduction to this society was through brutality. Um, that was our introduction, and it was brutality that was ramped up more and more, and also became complicated, because it became integrated with capitalism, and it became integrated with the politics, it became integrated with the sociology here. What our issue is, is that we have not been able to separate ourselves and create an ideology and a paradigm amongst a group of other species who have been predatory towards us. Mm -hmm. And what we have to be careful of is in our pedagogy, adopting the tools of the people who have oppressed us. Mm -hmm. And not just in our drive for wealth, but in our drive for solutions. Earlier, I, I just, a lot of amazing things that were said, but one, somebody said like, oh, I wish something like this would happen every week. And I want to like really just go for a quick second just about like the science of the cipher. As a young Bible Center, we would get together and we would build, and that'd be the first thing we would do. We'd get together, come from all parts of the city, and we would meet and we'd stand in the cipher. And sometimes it'd be a cipher this big, and people have to go around us, and cops would have to go around us. They have to go around us. The power was just too great. But what we were doing is we were checking in with each other. Back then, we were checking in with each other's minds to see where our minds are at. As we've grown and evolved, my brothers and I, now we check in with each other mentally, emotionally, spiritually. How you doing? I do a lot of brother, uh, it doesn't matter who I do business with. It could be black, white, whatever. First thing I always ask them, how you doing today? What's going on? What's on your mind? How you feeling? Right? This is the cipher. That's what the cipher is. And the cipher could be two people. It could be 25 people. It could be three people. My wife and I, we go a uh, monthly potluck for people in our community. We invite like 150 people, usually it's like 30 or 40. Before we bless our food, we all get in the cipher and we sit and we just build and talk about whatever is on our minds, what's happened that day, you know? So this is a daily practice. And if we make ciphers daily practices, it is an exchange, right? Like I'm giving something, but I also have to be willing to receive. And that's with your children, that's with the youth, that's with your elders, that's with your peers. If we get to that level, step by step, we will keep building that community and getting back to that essence.